Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, you can call the number on your screen. We will take care of that for you. We will get it signed, and we will have it shipped to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Well, this evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Dr. Ramgiri Braun and his new book, Heart Sourcing, Finding Our Way to Love and Liberation. And here to introduce Dr. Brown, we have a special guest. He is a local acupuncturist and a friend of the author's. Please welcome to the microphone, Mr. Dan Neville. Yeah, I'll curve it up if that's okay. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, really a great joy for me to be here this evening uh, to introduce my dear friend Ram Giri, uh, especially at the launch of his, the birth and the launch of his new book. And it's particularly uh, pleasurable for me to do this at uh, Books and Books. As somebody who was uh, born and raised and grew up in Miami, I've had the pleasure of watching Miami turn into what was really a small town, into a great international, diverse, uh, culturally expanding and richer community. And Books and Books has always been for me one of the sort of almost iconic in how it sits and, and the role that it's played in, in continues to play in growing Miami as a cultural place. And so for, uh, to have this event, to see something that, you know, was important for me throughout my entire life and to watch my friend launch his book here this evening is, is really a pleasure and a, a great joy. Uh, I've been able to uh, watch sort of the, uh, the manifestation of this book from what I think would be like almost the preconception stages. More than a decade ago, uh, up in uh, an ashram that uh, Ram Giri and I were both spending some time at at the time, where Ram Giri lived for quite a while, uh, he and I would engage in, in conversations. And one of the things I learned early about uh, Ram Giri in our conversations was that it was very easy to drop deep quickly with him. Not that he wouldn't engage in shit chat, but uh, there was an environment set where one could get into you know, deep and meaningful conversations uh, with always sort of the uh, mists of spirituality sort of surrounding it. And uh, at the time, I remember when I first met him, it was interesting because as a member of the counterculture in the 1960s, uh, Ram Geary had engaged uh, what a lot of the people of the 60s were doing and had uh, sort of followed his heart. So it's interesting to me. I always thought of Ram Giri as someone who was following his heart and he ends up birthing a book called Heart Sourcing. Uh, and it took him down a lot of different and varying paths that a lot of the seekers of the 1960s were, were, uh, were taking at the time. And Ram Giri fa uh, found himself in the presence of uh, who was, you know, his, his guru and I'm sure he'll share some of that experience tonight. Uh, as did several of the other people who have become almost iconic as we've moved forward into this movement. You know, people such as Ram Das, uh, who's had you know, his whole sort of stream that's flown into many, many new streams. And uh, Krishna Das, who's sort of pioneered uh, in a lot of ways um, uh, Kirtan in America. And you know, here I met this man, Ram Giri, who um, had had that same interesting direct experience and my first impulse was that he, he too had the same sort of um, very important message to share and to get out there. And what I realized early on about uh, Ram Giri that was slightly different than these other two who had sort of moved out immediately into the world and did their maturation process sort of as, as in public and in a public way that I was with somebody who had, who had taken what he had done and taken it into his personal life and taken it into his family life and had been cultivating for an extended period of time, that he was really maturing it. 
And he brings forth now coming out into the public view in a, a mainstream way as somebody that has the, the uh, great gift of being able to uh, share with us not just with introspection, which all of these people were doing at that time, or prospection of looking into the future that we were doing at that time, but from the ripe and mature perspective of having retrospection. And so to me, when he began to work on this book, what I had hoped for was something that would sh simultaneously share the breadth, the breadth and depth of what he had done and also uh, present some, let's say, basic tools that each of us could attach to and maybe integrate in our lives. And I found so far that for those people who have been experienced and have been cultivating and doing this kind of path for an extended period of time, there's the story itself is of use and, there's, and tools of great value, but it also can speak immediately to the, to the newcomer, so the person entering, that it's, a, it's very accessible in that way. And so, you know, I actually had little tears of joy when I was reading through the book that, that Ram Geary had given birth to what, what we had sort of spoken about a decade ago. And part of the richness of this book and part of the, uh, uh, the value of the book is that it's, uh, it's sort of empirically based. We think a lot in medicine about empiricism. You know, we want to see it actually work. And in this case, the, the laboratory uh, the refinements, the sort of uh, clarifications of a lot of these ideas ran through the laboratory that was Ram Giri, and also because he's had a continuous um, uh, therapeutic practice where he counsels people and uh, now is uh, working in a private context where I've gotten the great pleasure of sort of sharing clients with him that we work in common. So I've been able to see how what he does and works with on an individual basis is able to assist and help people. And uh, as someone who's been doing this for decades and who has not himself yet ventured into the writing of the book because I think it's such a challenge to translate into the written word what it is you're able to do on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think that he's accomplished that. And so it's really, a, a, you know, a, a remarkable moment for me to be here at sort of the birthing of this book as, as not just the book, Heart Sourcing, uh, starts to uh, wend its way out into the world, but to see Ram Geary in this new and I'm sure ever expanding role and context and to have it happen in my hometown is uh, particularly sweet for me. So I give you Ram Geary. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> It's great to hug Dan because I can look up to someone. <laughs> it's not so easy when you're 6'4". It <laughs> doesn't happen so often. So um, let me pick up on some of the things that you said. I want to invite you today, and maybe challenge you. And as you'll see, we'll, we'll drop deep right away. Why waste time? <laughs> I want to invite or challenge you to set yourself a task that you may find impossible. And that is to live in a state, increasingly permanent state, of true unconditional love. In our culture, we think of that as something that saints do, sages do, angels do but not we who have to deal with the daily world of worries and hassles and challenges. But my friends, nothing less than that is going to give you what you're really looking for. We're all looking for happiness. But happiness, we think, can be found when we get this, or we get that, or we get away from this, or get away from that. And that's impossible. Because happiness is right inside of us. And we need to find it there, and we can find it there. So I picked a few spots out of this book to give you a little taste. <coughs> The introduction is called, what else? The heart. 
Have you known moments when you were down on your knees, speechless in the presence of wonder, tasting the greatness of the world in profound gratitude, awash in pure bliss, and a love so vast it can embrace everything. These moments reveal to you what you truly are, and that your soul is free beyond measure. Perhaps it was when you were awed by a sunrise, looked at the eyes of a newborn child, or felt the heart of a sage, and were shaken to your very core by the depth of what you saw that was a reflection of you. During such glimpses, you knew that all you wanted is to be one with this wonder, this enormous compassion, this boundless joy and tranquility. Perhaps you were praying for surrender, praying that it would last. And after a while, sure enough, the everyday reality swallowed you again with its worries and stress its many challenges and the unrelenting search for higher reality you could enjoy if... Well, what if exactly? And how? What is missing? What keeps going wrong? Why do you fall out of love and peace into trouble? And how can you live permanently in this great harmony this vast love you instinctively know must exist. The purpose of this book is to inspire your heart and mind, for unless we love, there is no happiness. It is to support your invincible power to overcome any hardship on the road to enlightenment. You will find within these pages profound inspiration that can enable you to dissolve the causes of fear and suffering through some of the most practical and effective means, stillness, cultivating self-love and devotion, releasing emotions, and clearing the mind. This is the cumulative process of heart sourcing to elevate your consciousness by the power and purity of the heart. So, heart sourcing is based on an insight that is extremely simple and revolutionary. And that is that we have in us the source of all true and lasting happiness. Now, we know that, sort of. But we can live it. We can live it in our day-to-day -day lives. As Rumi said, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. We don't have to seek for that love, but heart sourcing allows us to drop into the heart, into that space where we are secure, at peace, and truly comfortable within ourselves, where we love us with a love that embraces everything. So perhaps all of you have had some taste of that, small or large, it doesn't matter. What matters is whether you get serious in honoring your desire to work, to live in that space all the time. It's that seriousness, that earnestness, that commitment that you will not take no for an answer that will allow you to succeed. So you have 
a goal of that magnitude, of that quality, that then the next thing you need are the skills. And the skills, aside from dropping into the heart again and again, and how we do that and what it means, which is the essence of heart sourcing, these skills, other than that, are to remove what stands in the way, what pulls us out of the heart. And there are really only very few things. In my practice of many years of psychotherapy, it became simpler and simpler. Psychology can get tremendously complex with thick books of different diagnoses. But what ails us is really just that. Our minds get distracted. And we have to counteract that distraction. We do that by stillness, by finding, relaxing, into quiet. Meditation is the primary mode of this, but there's many ways of doing it. The next layer of obstacles that blocks us out of the heart are stressful thoughts. And in my own case, I had maybe 30 years, no, over 30 years of meditation practice, very focused meditation practice, and still, there were thoughts and beliefs that would derail me because I was so wedded to them that I thought they're just the way the world is. People hurt other people. Well, I was raised in the aftermath of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. I knew that people hurt people. I couldn't question that until I met a skill called the work, that allows you to examine the mind with the mind, and these thoughts could not survive that, and they set me free. And the third layer that we have to free ourselves of, so we have distracted mind, we have specific stressful thoughts, the next layer, painful negative emotions. And I worked with the people in my practice for many years, <coughs> developing something I called open attention. We open up toward what's going on inside of us, through the body, because emotions are felt in the body. And we pay attention to that which hurts, which we don't like to do. We run away from it, we push it away, we press it, we complain, we indulge but we don't really just look at it. And it turns out that when we do that, the emotional patterns of unhappiness in our lives dissolve. And then a little while later, Eckhart Tolle came out with his books, and he describes the same thing. He calls it presence. It's the way to come into the here and now and free ourselves of these layers of depression and anxiety and fear and whatnot. So good medicine has is the medicine itself, and it usually doesn't taste so good. So the medicine in this book are the skills that you learn, the practical skills to free yourself of these obstructions around the heart. But we put the medicine into some syrup, so it goes down a little easier. And that is the story. So I share with you my personal story. As I said, I was born and raised in Germany after the war. And it was a very unfriendly environment. And I was a very unhappy camper when I was a kid. And that was a great blessing. Because I was unhappy enough to have to seek for something else. I have to, have to seek for some resolution of this pain. And it made me curious to look outside the box and to make the long story that's described in the book very short. It brought me to India into the presence of this sage, Nimkaroli Baba. We called him Maharaji. 
Some of you may know him through the books of Ramdas or Krishnadas' singing. And this man was remarkable not because this was somebody who lived some years back, but because he showed us a mirror of who we are, each one of us, because he was human just like us. He was omniscient. He knew everything about us. And this became very obvious very quickly. But that wasn't the amazing thing, as amazing as that is. The amazing thing was that he could know everything about us, all our dark little secrets that we didn't want anyone to know. And he loved us, absolutely. He loved us with a love that was so powerful that just by stepping into his presence, we were forever changed. I have some of my friends, maybe two or three hundred Westerners ever met him. Some of my friends met him for half an hour and then had to leave. And they say, to this day, this was the most important moment in their lives. <coughs> Why? Nothing happened. The man had no teaching. He was just hanging out. <laughs> he was beyond doing this or teaching that. He just hung out. But the love was so palpable and was so powerful that it went inside of us by osmosis. And going on with my story. <laughs> there are two layers of, we can say, two types of qualities of unhappiness that we have. One is the day-to-day -day surface stuff, the worries and the concerns and the hassles of work and so on. So the skills help you with that in a great way. They can get you a better job, for instance. And it may be the same job you're having now. <laughs> but by being open and being present and by shedding your, the weight of emotions and distracted mind, you will come to love your life in a whole new way. But there are also the deep pain, the, the stuff that we really don't want to touch. <coughs> and my friends, if you want to be free, you have to be free of that as well. I'm not going to stand here and say this is easy. But the skills, as I collected them, it was like I had to get my ducks in a row, I had to get these skills all lined up, and then I knew I was ready. And when I was ready, I went to Auschwitz. Why not go right into the core of the darkness that was the bane of my life? And I spent some days <coughs> in this horrific place, and I knew, theoretically, that the light must be found also in the greatest darkness. That was good for a theory. And the wonderful thing I'm here to tell you was that I walked out of this place free. Free of what had depressed me and scared me and given me profound shame because I'm on the German side of that. All my life. So we all have something that feels really uncomfortable. And you may not even know what it is. Some of you will know, some of you may not. But I'm here to say to you that you can get free of anything, whatever it is, past abuse or neglect or trauma or accidents or whatever it is. Nowadays, it's just sufficient sometimes to turn on the TV. <laughs> whatever it is that oppresses you, you can become absolutely free of it. And then, jumping ahead again another year, I went back to India again. It was time. And I went back to my guru's ashram 
And I sat there one morning, and I was angry with him. And I was angry because I knew I had these great skills, but something was missing. Something was missing. I knew I needed something else. And why did I need it? Because I had made a commitment 40 years earlier, af shortly after he died. I made the commitment to live my life for one purpose, and that is to learn to share with you this profound love, this profound grace that we have. And to my surprise, it wasn't that I became the one who was able to love like that, but I got a message, and the message is that it is in us and it is available. And I'd like to read you whatever it is that I can put into words of what happened in that morning. And trust me, I can't put it into words. Because it was a, an experience we call the samadhi of a you know, super conscious state, perhaps, that sounds terrible. But you know, it was that type of an experience. The world was gone. I was gone out of this world. And I saw something, and I was given that missing piece. And even though words cannot do justice to it, the words can be a vehicle that can allow you to have a spontaneous experience of this state, this space that is available to all of us. And that's what I'm hoping for, for you. At six o'clock the next morning, pitch dark and cool in the mountain air, I was silently reciting an ancient chant, all 40 verses of it, again and again. After a while, the chant became like a drill. The words penetrating past all distractions, distractions into deeper and deeper layers of my being. The world disappeared. And I was taken deeper and deeper still. Then the internal space opened up. I entered into it like through a gate and realized for the first time the inner reality of the spiritual heart. In this interior dimension of the heart, I fell into a state of absolute wonder and awe. I found myself in what I can only describe as the manifest space of the absolute self, the world of enlightened sages, a Buddha realm, alive with layers upon layers of limitless, absolute, divine love, shining with a wondrous internal light, an infinite world that is completely unforgettable. It was a direct perception of the infinite reality hidden in all of us, a perception where seeing and feeling, hearing, smelling and tasting, duality and non-duality were all one in all-encompassing love. I went as deeply as I could into this miraculous state of being, the real world, of which our universe is but a shadow. And as I gazed at this truly indescribable reality around me in wonder, the wish arose to share its essence with others here on this lonely planet. Words formed in my mind. Within us, there are uncounted dimensions upon dimensions of pure, unconditional love without end. Let me say this again. Within us, there are dimensions upon dimensions of pure, unconditional love without end. Indeed, our innermost space 
is the most re sacred reality. It is the source of everything we truly long for, everything that makes life what we want it to be, solidly peaceful, fulfilled, secure, and filled with unwavering love. It is the cause of all healing, the true foundation of wealth, the limitless well of infinite joy. And we have missed it. We have looked for its gifts everywhere else. What a marvel that we have searched for it for thousands of years, have written countless books about it, forever yearned for it, and yet we have missed its life-giving presence, accessible right here in our hearts. It is the most sought-after secret hidden in plain sight. Out of that inner space of wonder, the cosmic heart is pouring itself continuously into our world. And we have not seen where our blessings and the fullness of life came from. We have been unable to use this grace that is so completely available. But now this can change. We can learn to tap into the source to enjoy its unimaginable gifts. The secret of secrets, now no longer hidden at all. So I'm doing justice to something that is beyond words and Here I stand, I can't do anything else. <laughs> um, any questions, any, anything you would like to share? I want to ask what you were chanting. This was the Hanuman Chalisa, if you know that. Yeah. It's a remarkable power in some of these uh, chants. Please. This is this is the next treat. When I'm done speaking, Durga will have some will offer some poems and some songs to us if you have the time to hang out. How is it related to your experience and your psychotherapy yes, this or whatever is it is that you are doing? See, I studied um, I was born into Christianity, I was raised Catholic then that didn't quite fulfill what I was looking for. So I turned east and I studied Buddhism, I studied Hinduism, the, the Vedantic uh, religion. And in that tradition, which was the tradition of my guru, one of the vehicles of developing devotion is this devotional chanting, or kirtan. And so that's what you're going to be hearing in a little while. So what does it have to do with freeing you from the experience of Osh? Auschwitz or one of those it has, it has, a good question, but it has to do with going into the heart. And what I found in connection with this experience in Auschwitz is that it was by seeking the, the peace and the resolution and the absolute peace that is in the innermost heart, by seeking that even in this place of utmost darkness, I was able to release myself from this burden that I had carried all my life. And so any tool, any way that I can free myself from oppression and find the heart is good for me. Comment and question. Please. Because you described a 30 year practice of meditation, the chanting, all of the different practices, the self inquiry, the work, the releasing of emotions. Um, and yet, then there's this moment of grace. Yeah. And so, I guess 
my comment and my question, maybe for you to comment some more on, is that I think sometimes as humans we're very impatient. And we want to chant the, the chant 40 times and, and have the bliss experience without all that. And, and, we, and I know that it's possible in one instant without even doing anything. And yet, I guess trusting the process. I, can you have some comments on that? Well, so we don't have to acquire something, right? It's not out there. We have to be what we already are. Now, how hard is that? Well, it is both effortless and it takes some real effort to free ourselves of what we're attached to that's not us. Like all the disturbances of mind, all the stressful and negative thoughts, all the emotional patterns that are with us and come again and again. So that's where our work is. Right? And, you know, we can work, we can work, we can work on this spiritual uh, path, but the real essence really comes through grace. Now, the work is like we're shaping in us a container for grace. Or another way of saying it is that our container, we have this container of grace like a cup, but it's upside down. So grace reigns profusely all the time, but nothing can get in. The work is to turn that thing around so it can open to the grace that is, that is there. And what is that grace? That grace is the essence of our own being. This, this grace is the essence of what is in everyone's heart. I just read a study today about resilience. Mm -hmm. And if you think about resilience, I think we all know what it is when you think about getting older. You know what that resilience is, but it's hard to define. And when you think about it, when they see the same people, elderly people, and who's resilient and who isn't, it comes down to almost like you were saying, gratitude. Mm -hmm. And even if we're faced with the same problems, who can overcome them and who takes that to another level versus who lets it come down and basically puts them down and they're not able to face it is that idea of resilience. And that's like a new study now of looking at resilience and looking at who can rise up from those situations. And I think it's something like you were thinking about and maybe in some way to think about it is gratitude. As well. Yeah, well, gratitude is sort of a direct step into the heart. Right. You, know, you find gratitude. Oh, you just, it all sort of just falls away, what we've been holding on to, right? So it's partly that and partly also to have that higher goal and really be committed to it. And then everything that we encounter, you know, like if we, for instance, encounter depression, what's the opposite of depression? Security, joy, liberation, right. That's the purpose of the depression. If you have anxiety, what's the opposite of that? Or fear? Self-love. That's the purpose of the anxiety and the fear, you see? Once you have these skills and the ability to understand that everything you're struggling with is the opposite waiting to be born, then nothing can be a bad thing any longer. You know, somebody comes and you're encountering this terrible situation suddenly or an illness or something, you know, and you wait and you say, I know I'm living in a loving universe, so how is this good? I can't see it right now. I had a cancer, possible cancer diagnosis some time ago, and I knew that it had to be good, but I had to look. It wasn't obvious on the surface, right? I had to look. And I'm very grateful I had that because then I remembered that three weeks before I got that news, I had this moment where I said, you know, I really would like to address that attachment that we all have to, to life, you know, and the fear of mortality that's the other part of that. You know, I'd really like to, to, 
to deal with that because you know, I have no access to that. Well, three weeks later, I got access to that. It was all good. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hey, I'm Gideon. How are you doing? Um, so you spend a lifetime reading all the books and getting all the insons, insights from all the great sages. Could you help us understand what what is the unique contribution of this book to everything else that has been written so far? So that we can get the highlight yeah. of mm -hmm. what is it that that book is helping us achieve? Well, um, I was not going to write a book because there are so many of them already. <laughs> so what's the use of writing another one? And then <laughs> my, my teachers started to get on my case. And they started to poke and poke more and then push. And so eventually I just thought, well, you know, there's something telling me something. So I considered it. And this was like 20 years ago. So I'm not very fast. <laughs> but I think what this book can contribute is it can give us another, this is not the only book of that nature now, of course, but it can give us a taste of what we truly are that we have missed. And not only a taste, but the way and the means to realize that and to have it in our daily lives as, as a tangible reality. How do you live in unconditional love all the time? And it's not going to be all the time right away, but you can touch on it. It's not that hard. You can touch on it. And this love, I should also say, this love is qualitatively different from what we have been calling love. Because what we have been calling love is some sort of emotional attachment. This is on a different level. It's that moment, like when you fall in love, there's a moment where you go, <gasps> and everything stops. And you have no thought. And you see that there is a miracle happening, something so profound. You see that you are one with this other person, that you are one with everything. And then very quickly the ego comes in and says, well, will you be mine? <laughs> and then the relationship that we call a loving relationship feeds off of this memory. But it's that moment into which we can train ourselves to go again and again and again until we realize that we have never really left it. And that the stressful thoughts and emotions and all the trouble of life have been like a dream. And we no longer need to be in that dream, or we can be in that dream and be awake to it here in the heart. And this is a qualitatively, profoundly different life. If you can live in that love, you're not only doing the best thing you can do for your life, you, can, you become somebody who can contribute something to the people around you, the world around you. That is the greatest service of all. And the great sages have said, to become enlightened is the greatest service you can do for humanity. So it's not an ego trip we're on. It's a trip beyond ego we're on. And that's a good trip. Let's do one more question. People that, that I've learned about that have come to the understanding of the place that I believe you to be now have given credit to having worked with the guru. Is the guru or the guide fundamental to making this progress and arriving to this place? Yes. Now, the question is what is the guru? The guru is life. 
the guru, when you understand the guru, you can live life from that space where every moment is a miracle. Where you know everything, omniscience, you know everything you need to know in that moment. You don't need to know more. You need to know very little. Was I the one who has formed these words? No, they just come out. Can I just be watching this process, or do I have to be in it like I am doing this? You see, it becomes easy. And when I'm with someone, can I see that light that I have tasted in me reflected in them? That's the guru, there, here. The guru is everywhere. And the guru is most tangibly available right here in the heart, you see? So my guru was this character who lived in India and wore a blanket wrapped around him, (laughs) and books were written about him, and so on. And if, for some reason, that personality comes to you and touches your life, which happens to some people even today, well, that's great. Enjoy it, love it, it's wonderful. But that's not necessary. And it doesn't happen to everyone. But everyone has that inner essence, and that's the inner guru, that the sad guru, the guru of truth. And that is the real guru, that's the one that matters, because even when you're with an outer guru, you better listen to that first. So there's a section in the book about you know, being with teachers who are controversial and all of that kind of stuff. You know? This is the teacher. The outer teacher is always just a mirror. It can be a fantastic mirror in which you can see things that you had no idea you even could imagine about yourself. Yes. But, you know, the people saying, oh, do I need to have a guru? Can I, who is my guru? Can I search for the guru? Don't search for a guru. That's hopeless. You'll, you're bound to end up with the wrong one. <laughs> search for this. And when this is ready, and it is necessary for you to meet someone in that role, you'll meet, they will find you. So we have another treat for you. And I don't want to overstay my welcome here too long, but we have this other treat for you. And this is Durga, who has some poetry and some music. And I just invite you to relax for a moment and to listen to the music and let it let what you've just heard maybe be assimilated a little bit deeper through just relaxing into those sounds relaxing into your heart so you can find what you're what you're looking for i can only point to where it is You're the one who has to find it. And we work with the left brain, we've done that now. So let's give a little space to the right brain and to the music and the heart of that, touching it in that nature. Please, welcome Durga. I didn't know it was going to be that many. I'm super happy I don't have enough of this. So if you are with somebody nearby that you can just pick on, this is pretty big size. And these are going to be the chants uh, that we'll be doing. I don't know if all of them, depending on the time. I have no idea what time it is. Uh, But just please feel free to pick this up, pass it around. Um, What we're going to be doing now is Ramgiri talked about that chant. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> Let's get to the to the to the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot hold this, so I'm just going to be trying to project myself. And um, if you want to sing with me, <coughs> if you know it by heart, go ahead. And if you don't, pick on the sheets. And, uh, and if you don't want to sing, just don't. You know this is. 
that about what we need to do and how to do. So I invite you to take a moment to perhaps close your eyes. Let's do three arms together. Take a deep inhale. Chant is to that Guru, 
inside us. Shri Guru Charanam, Shri Hari Charanam. Shri Guru Charanam, Shri Hari Charanam. Let's sing together. Shri Guru. Oh, 
Before we do that one more, I want to read one poem. I don't know which one, but. Yeah, I never use this. This is uh, written by Ramgiri, it's a devotional poem, and. Um, I think it fits into the energy we're creating here. My body is the beloved. She is the breath flowing in and out of me. My beloved and I are no longer separate. She is the mind that perceives itself. She is in all things that I will meet today. She is the bliss that runs through my veins. She has the form of the Guru. She has no form. She is emptiness in all things. She embraces me at all times. Come, come into this house where love is a substance, where we drunk with fulfillment, where body and mind turn into light, and the stillness of God turns to laughter. Find yourself here, where you have always lived. Have the beloved breathe you, dissolve into the bliss of your love. Then, touch the world lightly, as Eve caressing your lover and you will see how she reacts. She will come to you, yearning for your embrace. For she has longed to know you no less than you have desired her. God, Guru, yourself, and the world are all one and the same. Some forms arise, others dissolve. In the soft abyss of reality, your love joins them all. 
I wish there were my words, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are now. True. Yeah, I felt the like that. So let's finish with another chant to the mother. I'm just running that Shakti through me lately, and I can't stop. <laughs> So we're going to do a mantra to Saraswati. And Saraswati, yes, it is a deity from the Hindu tradition. But it's that part of us that expresses the best of who we really are. She's all about wisdom, about us helping us find that place in us where we can just drop everything and go out to the world and be who we are, really. So I love that. Um, it's very simple. Om Shri Saraswati -e has that little ye at the end. Om Shri Saraswati -e Namo. I forgot. Where is it? <laughs> Namaha. Om Shri Saraswati -e Namaha. Yeah, it'll come. Yeah. Nama Om. All right, I get it here. <laughs> the mind doesn't really work in this. <laughs> yes. So I'll repeat a few times, and whenever you feel to join, just do. And if you don't, just don't either.
Saraswati